Emily with the Lincoln County Public Library and welcome to another episode of I Survived the Connecting Link where we take the popular I Survived series by Lauren Tarshis and connect it to events that happened in Lincolnton, Lincoln County or in North Carolina. In today's episode we're going to hear from Dr. Ashley Oliphant who literally wrote the book on shark tooth collecting on the North Carolina coast. We're also going to hear from the City of Lincoln's Parks and Rec Director, Nathan Yuri, where he's going to give you some swimming safety tips when you're at the beach. And finally, we're going to hear from the staff at North Carolina Aquarium Fort Fisher, where they're going to tell you the importance of sharks and what they are doing to preserve them. So let's dive in. Hi, students. My name is Dr. Ashley Oliphant, and one of my main interests is learning about sharks. I think they are one of the most fascinating animals on the planet. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I've learned about sharks in my research. Uh, we're going to look at some cool shark teeth. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my book about sharks, and then we're going to get into a quick discussion about um, shark attacks in North Carolina and what you can do um, to protect yourself when, um, when you are in the ocean swimming. So I have been interested in sharks since I was about your age. My family um, would always either go to the North Carolina or South Carolina coast to go on vacation in the summers. And while there, my father would take me to the fishing pier and um, we would watch the fishermen sometimes bring in small sharks like sand sharks and hammerhead sharks. But I also had the opportunity um, as a, about a 10 or 11 year old to see a man catch a really large tiger shark. Um, and so um, I, I've always been fascinated by sharks in that way. And um, when I learned as a young child how to find shark's teeth on the beach, being able to come home from vacation with shark teeth in my hand um, just sort of fueled my excitement for learning more about sharks. And so um, a few years ago, I decided to look at my entire collection of shark's teeth that I had had gathered over the years. I had about um, at that point about 10 or 11,000 shark's teeth, but I wanted to know more about each one of the teeth I had found. I wanted to know what species of shark did it come from? How big was that shark? Uh, was that shark species still alive or was it extinct? And so I started looking around trying to find a book or some articles that would help me to answer those questions. And uh, I quickly realized the book that I want is not out there. So instead of being frustrated with that, I made the decision that I was going to write the book on my own. And so um, I began um, doing research. Uh, interviewing experts who knew more about fossil shark's teeth than I did. And the result was this book. It came out um, in 2015. It is called Shark Tooth Hunting on the Carolina Coast. And it is an all color guide um, that teaches the audience which beaches in North and South Carolina are the best ones to hunt for shark's teeth. And um, then it helps you uh, with an, an all color guide. It helps you to identify the species that you found. Um, and so um, from this book, um, a lot of people have begun to ask me to come around and um, to give short presentations um, to them about how they can learn how to find shark's teeth too. So if you are interested in this book, the Lincoln County Public Library System, I know they have at least one copy, but they may have more than that by now. Um, even if you are listening from the western end of Lincoln County or in the eastern end of Lincoln County and, and your specific library does not have a copy, um, you can ask a librarian to request this book um, and they can um, make sure uh, that you uh, have a chance to look at it if you're if you're interested. Um, and so when you go and hunt for shark's teeth at the beach, you're often going to find small teeth, um, such as this this tooth right here, right? Um, this is the um, lower tooth of either of either a bull shark or a dusky shark. Um, it's impossible to tell just from one tooth. So lots of teeth like this you'll find washed up on the beach. Um, they're usually black or brown or sometimes gray. Um, this tooth is a beauty. Um, I found it, I was hunting in Cherry Grove, South Carolina, and uh, very early in the morning I was out with my flashlight uh, and found this uh, tiger shark tooth. This is from the upper jaw of a tiger shark. Um, I was very jealous of my husband, also in Ocean Isle, North Carolina, and um, he got very excited because he pulled this tooth out of the uh, surf there. This is actually a juvenile or a young megalodon shark tooth. 
um, the top part of it, the root part is broken, but you can see from the enamel um, that, that even though this was a baby shark, uh, it was still a very large shark. And so Megalodon is, um, remember, the largest species of shark to ever live. And um, they went extinct three million years ago. So it always amazes me uh, when we find a Megalodon shark's tooth uh, to think, wow, I'm holding something that is at least three million years old and statistically speaking, probably a lot older than that. Um, when you um, get into shark tooth collecting, as I have over the years, you will quickly begin to realize that there are actually some really big shark teeth uh, for sale and they are, they're always Megalodon teeth. Um, this tooth is one of my favorites. Can you believe how big that is? Uh, this is a Megalodon tooth. Uh, and there is actually a formula that scientists use to, um, to help you learn about how big the shark was, right? Um, and so they measure the enamel, which is the shiny part here. Uh, and the formula is that every inch of tooth enamel represents 10 feet in length of shark. So let's do the measurement together here. That's about an inch. That's about an inch that's about an inch, and that's about an inch. So if we've got four inches, and each inch is worth 10 feet of shark, drum roll please, you know the answer. This was likely a 40 foot shark, um, which would be about the length um, of half of a football field. It's astonishing, right? Um, and so, um, actually not 40 feet, that's not a football field, I made a mistake. Um, 40 feet would be more like school bus. I was thinking too big there. Um, the size of a school bus, likely. Um, this is another megalodon tooth that's a lot of fun. This one came from um, Aurora in North Carolina. A lot of the teeth that you'll find in the eastern part of North Carolina have this really cool grayish, uh, whitish uh, color to them. Um, and so this is one of my favorites um, from, from that region. Even though it's not enormous, one of my favorite shark teeth that I have ever found um, is this guy, um, and this is one of the most interesting species of shark. This is a great white shark tooth from the upper part of the jaw. Um, I found this tooth, again, very early in the morning with my flashlight, uh, and it was um, May 2020 uh, was when I located this one. So uh, I think this one's just so beautiful, and it's one of my favorites. Um, so let's talk for a little bit about um, shark habitats, right? I know a lot of people, and maybe even you, um, you might be a little scared of the ocean because sharks live there, right? Um, but, but what we're going to talk about today um, is uh, hopefully going to provide you with the education that you need um, to, to recognize that um, the ocean is the shark's habitat, right? That habitat means where an animal lives. And so um, sharks, they live in the ocean, they live in the sea. Uh, and so we should not be surprised when we see a shark there just as bears and snakes and coyotes live in the forests all around our house. That doesn't prevent us from going outside, right? Uh, we just know that those animals are there and we are careful to be safe uh, when we're outside. So the same is true of a shark. You don't need to be afraid um, of sharks in the ocean because that's where they live. And in fact, um, if you are very observant at the beach, you're going to see sharks in the water, right? Um, if you're on a fishing pier, if you stare down at the water long enough, chances are you're gonna see a shark. Um, if you are uh, in the surf out where the waves are breaking and you pay attention um, to, to what's happening uh, in mother nature, chances are at some point you're gonna see a shark. So that's where they live and that's not really something that, um, that you need to be afraid. One of the main reasons for that is that humans are not the intended food source of sharks, right? They don't want to eat us. Uh, in fact, um, the statistical likelihood of you being bitten by a shark or any person being bitten by a shark is one in 11 million people. Um, and so that's statistically speaking, it's very rare and very unlikely that, that anybody is going to be bitten by a shark. Within, those, um, within that statistical window of one in 11 million, there's an even smaller percentage of those people who actually do get bitten by a shark that end up having a bite that turns out to be fatal, uh, which means leading to death, unfortunately. So um, the chances of, of that happening are so, so far and remote um, that, that really, um, I don't think about it very much when I am, um, when I'm in the ocean. The reason for that is that 
Um, we have learned from scientists that almost all shark attacks are accidents. They did not intend to, to bite us, to eat us, right? The way shark feeding occurs is that before shark eats its prey uh, in the ocean, it's gonna come up and take a test bite, which is one quick bite um, to be able to determine if that thing that they've bitten is something that they want to eat, right? Sharks are a very special animal in that they have a mechanism in their mouth that will allow them to, um, to, to take a bite and that bite will send a message to their brain to tell them whether or not they should eat the thing that they have just bitten. And so in the, the case of uh, most of the cases when a, a shark does attack a human, that test bite tells them, uh oh, that's not something I wanna eat. So most shark bites on humans are a quick one bite and then the shark retreats and leaves because it realizes that it does not want to eat the human um, that it has just bitten, right? So a place for you, um, if you're really interested in what I'm saying, and I hope you are, um, a place for you to do some further research. Um, and you can find this free online um, if you'll just put into your Google search bar. Um, may need to ask your mom and dad to help you out with that. It's called the International Shark Attack File. Um, that is a, uh, a group of scientists have gotten together and collected all of the reliable accounts of humans being bitten by sharks internationally across the world. Um, and they have been keeping those records since 1935. So if you wanna learn more um, about our discussion today, that would be a great place for you to go, a great website to go and click on all of the different links because there are all of these individual documents um, that will teach you so much about shark behavior um, and even give you data about where specific attacks happen. So um, because we are in North Carolina, um, I know you're probably gonna wanna know what are our statistics that relate to, um, relate to shark attacks um, here. So North Carolina is statistically um, consistently in the top five uh, of states in the United States for shark attacks. Um, and so um, since 1935, there have been 67 documented shark attacks in North Carolina. Um, the majority of those shark attacks have happened in Brunswick County, which is where Holden Beach and Ocean Isle Beach are. Um, that is the area where we're talking. Um, since 1935, they have had um, 16 documented shark attacks there. Um, you, when you look at the data in the international shark attack file, um, it may seem like over time there is an increasing number of shark attacks. So it might from that data appear that since 1935 shark attacks have been increasing over time. That's a little problematic and let me explain why. Um, record keeping, the ability for humans to keep track of the number of shark attacks that record keeping has gotten better over time, right? So with social media, with the news covering attacks, word kind of spreads more quickly than it used to. Um, and so the, the higher rate of reporting can be um, a, a big thing to, to take into account when considering why those numbers seem to be going up. Another issue that you want to sort of factor into that data uh, is that increasingly every year, more and more people are going to the coast to go on vacation. Um, and so what that means is that there are just simply more people in the water, um, uh, more opportunities for, um, for people to be unfortunately bitten by a shark. Um, so that's a little bit about the history of shark attacks in, uh, in North Carolina. So while you should not live in fear of, of a shark attacking you while you are, um, while you're on vacation or while you're at the, at the coast, um, there are some things that you can do to make sure um, that you're being as safe as you can be. So scientists who have spent their careers studying shark behavior have learned some things that they're able to share with us that will help us um, stay as safe as possible when we are swimming in the ocean. Uh, the number one thing I would say, uh, and, and that's the science has told us, is that swimming at dawn early in the morning before the sun is completely up or swimming at dusk, which is those hours in the evening right around the time that the sun is gonna go down. Those are the two worst times for you to be swimming in the ocean. And the reason for that is the water clarity um, is not as good as it would be, right? So um, many shark attacks will happen at dawn or dusk because the water's not clear, the light's not coming through the water. 
and the shark makes a mistake. It thinks it's biting food when in fact it realizes, uh oh, I've bitten a human and it leaves, right? Um, so you don't want to put yourself in a situation where um, the shark may be confused because you're swimming in cloudy water or, or water that, that there's, um, there's no light for them to, to be able to make a better decision about whether to eat or not. Um, next, you never want to swim near a fishing pier or where um, someone is fishing. Now, uh, when I say swim, I'm talking about in water that's your waist or higher that you're actually swimming in, right? Uh, I'm not talking about wading out up to your knees or anything. I'm talking about actually swimming. Um, but smaller fish are attracted to whatever fishermen and women are putting out on their lines, right? And so um, uh, fishing piers uh, are actually where the food chain is happening, right? Smaller fish are coming in to eat the shrimp or the worms or whatever's on the fisherman's line. Those smaller fish mean that bigger fish are gonna be there to eat the smaller fish, which means that big fish are gonna be there to eat the medium-sized fish, which means that great big fish are gonna be there to eat the bigger fish. Um, and so um, essentially the, the fishing pier represents the food chain in action. Uh, and you wanna make sure that you're not swimming when that's happening. Likewise, and this is an interesting one that a lot of people don't think about. In recent years, scientists are noticing the correlation or the, the relationship between shark accidental bites and people who were swimming with dogs, right? Um, so they have, have actually come out and said, it's really not a good idea for you to have your dog in the ocean and for you to actually be swimming in deep water with a dog. The reason for that, they say, is that a dog swimming, right? You've seen a dog doggy paddle. They look very awkward. In fact, a dog, that awkwardness swimming makes it look like an injured animal. Um, and sharks, uh, one of their prey, uh, right, is, um, is injured animals. Um, and so um, you don't want to be um, swimming in, in a situation where um, uh, the, the shark may be mistaken by um, either your dog or even if someone else's dog is in the water. Just it's a good idea for you to just step out and not be swimming at that time. Also, you want to make sure that you are not swimming when birds are swooping or diving. Um, or when you see fish jumping, right? So the only reason a, a bird which, you know, you could see them flying over the ocean. The only reason the bird's going to come down is because it sees a fish. It can only see that fish because it's come to the surface. And there's usually only one reason a small fish has come to the surface, and that's because there is a bigger fish coming up underneath it to try to eat it, right? Um, and so a bird fishing means smaller fish have come to the surface, which means that bigger fish are trying to get them from the bottom. Um, and those bigger fish getting them from the bottom could potentially be a shark. Um, and so if you see um, either fish jumping in a school or you can actually see the birds swooping down to get fish, that's a pretty good signal that you should maybe um, get out of the ocean for a little bit, maybe have a snack, go to Sandcastle um, and wait a little bit before you go back in. Um, you also, when you're in the ocean, want to avoid flailing around or playing, um, especially um, splashing in a, in, a, um, uh, in a wild sort of way, um, because you may attract the attention of a shark, um, kind of like the dog scenario. Uh, might, it may make, make it to the shark look like that you are injured, um, and so you want to avoid that. Um, you also want to stay really close to shore. It's just not a good idea to go swimming very far from shore. And there are lots of reasons for that. that you know, all kinds of things can happen um, when you're away from the shore and the further distance you have, um, the less likely it is you're going to be able to get back to shore and get help quickly. Um, so staying close to shore is always a good idea. Two more points that are important. Um, scientists have told us that sharks see bright colors really well. Um, and that they can see contrast between colors very well. And so it's very fascinating. Um, they have come out in recent years and told us that um, it's kind of not a good idea to be wearing a brightly colored bathing suit if you're gonna be swimming in deep water um, because those bright colors, and it, the interesting thing is that they've identified yellow, um, that, that sharks really love the color yellow. Um, so I never buy a yellow bathing suit. I know that seems silly, but I just, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, so uh, again, I'm not talking about splashing in, in or swimming in shallow water. 
if you're going to be doing any kind of actual swimming, um, I would advise for that to not happen with brightly colored swimwear. And then the last thing, um, it's a good idea for you to not wear jewelry when you are swimming in the ocean, um, especially a dangly bracelet or an anklet, um, because that reflection, um, scientists have told us, could potentially, um, uh, the, the reflection from that shiny metal um, could attract the shark. Kind of like a fishing lure, right? A lot of fishermen and women will use um, shiny metal lures because the, the reflection and the action of the movement will attract the eye of a fish. Um, the same will happen with a shark. And so uh, swimming uh, with uh, is not a good idea. Um, so that is a little bit of information about sort of sharks in general, sharks in North Carolina, um, things that you can do to keep yourself safe when you are in the ocean, um, and um, a little bit more about my book. So um, I hope you will um, endeavor to learn more, right? Uh, go to the library and check out books about sharks with your mom and dad's help. Look up some websites and, and learn as much as you can. And if you're really interested in sharks, know that there are careers um, that um, you can make your whole job um, uh, around studying sharks. And so um, I hope you will pursue your passion if sharks is something that, that you're interested in. And I have really enjoyed talking to you. Hope you guys have a great day. Hello, this is Nathan Urey with the City of Lincoln and Parks and Recreation Department. As an American Red Cross water safety instructor and being a proud provider of the American Red Cross Learn to Swim program and water safety courses, we are helping to do our part through educational videos, classes and demonstrations, as well as teaching swimming lessons to help prevent drowning in our community. Some of you watching may have already read or plan to read the book, I Survived the Shark Attacks of 1916. Today, I'd like to take a few minutes to focus on general swimming rules for the ocean and ways to help you survive if you find yourself in trouble in the ocean. Some of you vacationed at the beach this past summer, and if you're like me, you are already looking forward to going to the beach again when summer rolls back around. Here are a few rules to follow when you visit the beach. Know where the closest lifeguard stand is. Check to see if any warning flags have been raised. Before entering the water, know what the surf conditions are. Never swim near pilings, piers, diving platforms, and observe any dangerous signs. Watch out for dangerous marine life. If you swim out from shore, remember you have to swim back, so save enough energy to swim back safely. If you find yourself caught in a rip current, don't try swimming against it or fighting it. You can make it back to shore by swimming gradually away from the rip current and parallel to the shore until you are out of the rip current. Once out of the current, swim to shore. As mentioned above, it is important to swim in areas that are supervised by lifeguards. Before leaping into the water to swim, check out the site before going in. Choose a site where a lifeguard is on duty. Know your swimming ability. Weak and non-swimmers should not swim in water that is over chest deep. Diving into waves should never be attempted in cloudy, murky, and rough water, as it could result in a head, neck, or back injury that could lead to paralysis. Check the water temperature. Swimming in cold water could lead to a serious medical condition known as hypothermia. If you experience uncontrollable shivering or purplish, bluish lips or fingertips, get out of the water and warm up. Swimming in the ocean, the water can be cloudy and murky, often hiding dangers underneath the surface of the water, such as rocks, broken bottles, cans, weeds and grass, holes and drop offs. Also be aware of strong currents, boat traffic and marine life. Swimming alone can be dangerous. Why shouldn't you swim alone? Well, if something happens to you and you're in trouble, there would be no one there to help you. So remember, swimming with a buddy allows for you to be responsible in getting help for your buddy or for them to get help for you in the event either of you were to get into trouble in the water. If you use a life jacket for swimming or you are riding a jet ski or boat in the ocean, 
There are two things to always check when selecting a life jacket to wear. First, all life jackets, or PFDs for short, should have a stamp of approval by the United States Coast Guard. This stamp of approval is located on the inside of the life jacket. Make sure you use only these types of devices as they have been thoroughly tested. Second, make sure you select the proper size PFD. To make sure a PFD is effective, make sure it fits correctly and wear it correctly. Finally, what you should do if you encounter marine life such as jellyfish, stingrays, or sharks. If you are stung by a jellyfish, do the following. Get out of the water and get help from a nearby lifeguard if available. Stop the stinging. Avoid rubbing the area and rinse the area with vinegar at least 30 seconds. If tentacles are still on the skin, remove them with tweezers. Avoid putting ice or ice packs on the sting. And check with your doctor. They may advise you to treat any discomfort with a mild hydrocortisone cream or an oral antihistamine to relieve itching or swelling. If you are stung by a stingray, do the following. Seek immediate medical attention from a nearby lifeguard if available. If immediate medical attention is not available, remain in the ocean and pull the barb out if you can. Allow salt water to clean the wound. Apply direct pressure over the wound to slow the bleeding and to encourage the venom to come out. If fresh water is available, flush the wound with fresh water. And for pain relief, soak the wound in water as hot as the person can tolerate. Be sure to clean the wound with soap and fresh water and check with your doctor for further treatment recommendations. Last, follow these tips to avoid being attacked by a shark. Always swim in a group and don't swim or wander too far from the shore. Avoid swimming or going into water at night, early morning or at dusk. Don't enter the water if bleeding and don't wear shiny jewelry in the water. Don't go into waters containing sewage or storm water drain runoff. Avoid waters that are being fished or areas with lots of bait fishes. Diving seabirds are a good indicator of this. Don't enter the water if sharks are present. Avoid wearing brightly colored clothing and avoid an uneven tan. Avoid splashing the water a lot. This can attract sharks. Use care when swimming around sandbars and steep drop-offs. These are areas where sharks like to hang out. Don't try touching a shark if one is seen. Listen to the lifeguards and heed all warning signs and warning flags. Most shark bites are accidental, but if they continue to attack, fight back. Try hitting the shark in areas that are sensitive to the shark such as the snout, eyes, and gills and get out of the water as soon as possible as the shark may attack again. When swimming away, keep your movement smooth and calm to avoid attracting the shark's attention again. To learn more or for more information, visit the International Shark Attack File site. I hope you have learned something and that you'll remember these tips for the next time you visit the beach. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Andy Gould. I'm the Education Curator here at the North Carolina Aquarium at Fort Fisher. And here at the aquarium, we love our sharks. We love the sharks out in our ocean because they help to keep balance in our ecosystems. As a top predator, they make sure that we don't have too many of one kind of fish and not enough of another. We also love the sharks here in our care at the aquarium. They help us to tell stories about our sharks and share with our visitors all the amazing things that sharks have to teach us. Let me tell you a little bit more about the kinds of sharks that we care for here at the aquarium. One species you see swimming right behind me right now, that's called the bonnethead shark. It's the smallest member of the hammerhead family. And they get the name bonnethead because they have a rounded head where other hammerheads have more of a flat head. They use that rounded head to help them swim more easily through the water. 
and they have little receptors on the end of their head that help them to find their food. Another species that we care for here is the sand bar shark. This is a really common species off the coast of North Carolina, and they get the name sandbar because they like to hang out around sandbars and hunt for small fish. This happens to also be the same habitat where we like to swim and surf and play, and we're able to share that habitat completely peacefully with sandbar sharks. The largest shark we have in our care is the sand tiger shark right on cue. There's another one swimming by right there. That's a sand tiger shark. And they are really easy to identify because they always have a big toothy smile on their face and their bodies are covered in polka dots. We love our sand tigers so much that we have two different ways that we are working to learn more about them. Our staff have been going offshore for several summers now, fishing for sand tiger sharks and inviting them up to the side of our boat. While they're there, we put a small tag on them so that we can follow their movements. This is telling us more about how they use habitats off of our coast, and that's gonna help us to be able to better protect those habitats. Another research project we have is called Spot a Shark USA. Spot a Shark uses volunteer scuba divers to go off our, off our shore and take photos of sharks. They can head to their favorite shipwreck or a more natural habitat like the one behind me, and they might find one shark there or they might find several hanging out in a group together. We ask them to take some photos of those sharks and share with us when and where they took those photos. We can then use the spot pattern on the sharks to tell who is who and be able to better tell uh, more about how they're using the habitat. We can identify them with their spots because each individual shark has a unique spot pattern, kind of like our fingerprints. By studying these sharks, we are learning more about how we can better protect them, and they certainly need our protection. Did you know that 100 million sharks are killed by human action every year? The majority of these are killed through bycatch or accidental catch. That's when we're out looking for seafood that we're gonna enjoy, but we accidentally catch sharks and other species in the process. Thankfully, there are ways to collect seafood from the ocean that are not harmful for sharks or other animals. We call these sustainable seafood choices and there's a great way for you to learn more about them. Monterey Bay Aquarium has a program called Seafood Watch, and you can go to their website, seafoodwatch.org. Once you're there, you can type in whatever kind of seafood you're hoping to enjoy. It will tell you if it's a healthier option for our ocean, or if it's not the most sustainable choice. If it's not the best choice, it'll recommend something that tastes similar and is healthier for our oceans. Ultimately, it's up to us to ensure that sharks survive. We need to learn more about them and be able to better protect them in our ocean so that we know we'll have sharks around for many generations to come. We hope you will join us in our efforts to learn more and better protect our sharks. you've learned about sharks in real life, let's talk about the history of the shark attacks of 1916. It's been more than 100 years since the shark attacks of 1916 changed public perception of ocean safety. Before 1916, scientists were sure that sharks were shy, weak-jawed creatures that wouldn't harm a human. Remember, marine biology was just starting out and not much was known about the world's oceans. In 1891, American businessman and multimillionaire Herman Ulrichs decided to offer a $500 prize reward for anyone who could prove that there was a shark attack on the eastern coast of the USA from North Carolina up. The fact that it took decades before anyone claimed that prize really pushed home the idea that sharks were gentle. After the New Jersey attacks, sharks became the feared creatures that they are today. However, the more you learn about sharks, the more you realize that they need to be respected and studied. They are not mindless killers, and they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs. Of the more than 350 shark species known, only four are prone to attack humans. Those are the bull shark, the hammerhead, the tiger shark, and the great white shark. 
Some scientists believe that sharks don't even mean to attack humans, but they mistake surfers and swimmers for large marine animals like seals. This could be why most shark attacks on humans aren't fatal. The shark realizes its mistake and then swims off. Also, shark attacks are extremely rare. Some say that you're more likely to get hit on the head with a coconut on the beach than you are to be bit by a shark. In fact, it's humans who are more dangerous to sharks than sharks are to humans. Every year, humans kill about 100 million sharks. They want to use their fins for shark fin soup. Many shark species are in danger of disappearing from the oceans forever. This is really bad because they help control the fish population. So, as we go forward, we need to make sure that we don't overfish the shark population and we need to protect our oceans by not polluting it. So let's talk about the fictional tale, I Survived the Shark Attacks of 1916. In this story, Chet Roscoe moves to New Jersey to live with his Uncle Jerry who runs a diner. He's eager to fit in, and when a few boys invite him to the local swimming hole, he's really excited. But what happens when he comes face to face with a man-eater? If that book sounds interesting to you, you can check it out from your local library, or you can check out the graphic novel version. Thank you for joining me here today with another episode of I Survived the Connecting Link. We'll see you again soon. Bye!